to our topic for today, which is infographics. Uh, and joining us is Joe Shulak, who's in New York City. He's an alum of our program. He's an alum of SDSU. And he's had a long career with um, and, and creating infographics. For Joe, he loves boiling down information into clear, engaging, and attractive presentations using information graphics, illustrations, and design, which is all just part of his passion for storytelling. And here at JMS, we like to say that we make storytellers. That's what we do. And we recognize that there are many different ways to tell stories. And so for much of Joe's career, it's been doing it through visuals, through infographics. And there's such an important part of so many different things that uh, in the news and in PR is understanding how to use infographics, how do you create them? Uh, and so Joe is definitely an expert in that. Currently, he's a UX UI designer for JP Morgan Chase, where he still uh, helps create illustrations and graphics for them. Previously, he worked as a graphics editor in the Wall Street Journal newsroom. He worked as a senior illustrator at X Plane in Portland and worked for over 15 years at the San Francisco Chronicle, an examiner where he earned numerous awards from the Society of News Design and an Excellence in Journalism Award from the Society of Professional Journalists of Northern California. But he will tell you more about his career, but that's just a little brief snapshot. Uh, before I turn things over to him, just as a reminder, uh, he will be happy to answer questions. So at any time while he's presenting, you can just type them into the chat or into the Q&A box. And at the end of his presentation, I'll be uh, asking him any questions that you come up with. You can uh, message me directly too if you have questions and I'll be share, uh, sure to share those with Joe. But enough of me rambling on, I would like to turn things over to you, Joe, because they're here to listen to you and not to me. And so uh, take it away. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thank you very much, Temple. I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna hit play here and we're gonna move on. So can you see my screen, Temple? Yes, perfectly. All right, so thank you for that introduction. Wow, you stole a lot of my thunder. I was gonna go over uh, my career, but you did a great summary, I appreciate it. And I uh, also wanna thank all the alumni, faculty, students, and others on the call today. I'm so happy to talk to you about my career in infographics over the years. Uh, Temple asked me to talk about two things in particular, um, the type of infographics that I created in my career and then also how I created them. So I'm gonna go over a couple of, a few examples of uh, the infogra some of the infographics that I created from sketch through the editing process and then how it finally um, appeared in print in the newspaper. Now, um, but first I'll take a step back as Temple said, um, I went to San Diego State. I'm a proud uh, alumna of San Diego State. Um, but prior to that, I'm from Wisconsin. So I'm a cheesehead, very proud of that. When I was 20 years old, I moved from Wisconsin to San Diego, eventually graduated from San Diego State with a journalism degree and a graphic arts minor in 1985. Okay, I'm gonna rip the Band-Aid off that until the year right, right away. Um, so I'm old. I graduated in 1985. Um, uh, then after that, I uh, got a job at the Ithaca Journal in upstate New York. Now I always wanted to move back to California. So I had a great opportunity to work after Ithaca to, uh, and I moved to Santa Barbara to work for the New York Times Company in Santa Barbara, California for a few years and then moved on to the San Francisco Examiner, then the San Francisco Chronicle. Then I decided to leave journalism and I got a job with Explain, a, a, a design firm in Portland, Oregon. Um, and that was like going to business school. It was amazingly um, important for me and my, I learned so much from that as far as business development and, and, and that kind of thing. It, I, I forgot whether I said this or not, but x created infographics for Fortune 500 companies. So that was their main focus. Uh, they do now web pages, illustration, infographics, a variety of things. Um, and then from uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, and I moved to New York to work for the uh, Wall Street Journal as graphics editor for six years. And then as Temple said, I left there 
and have been at JP Morgan Chase now for the past six years. So back in the day, <laughs> uh, I had dark hair. Um, I worked, uh, I went to school at San Diego State. Like I said, I graduated in uh, 1985. While I was there for a few years, I worked at the Daily Aztec. You can see my, um, my card over there on the right. And uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, while I was at the Daily Aztec, I was a reporter. I wrote a lot of stories, a good variety of stories. And I learned, you know, not only did I work with some of the most, uh, you know, super smart, talented, hilariously funny people, you know who you are. It was a great time. Um, but we got a lot of great journalism done and it was just, it was, it was amazing. And I learned two things. First of all, I learned editing. I learned that you could write the most pristine, greatest story ever. And then you'd have to sit down with an editor and they could just take whole paragraphs of your story and move them from the top all the way down to the bottom. And it can be very frustrating, but you need to separate your ego and say, hey, the story is gonna be better. And of course it always was. The second thing that I learned is that I, I didn't wanna be a reporter. I mean, I know that sounds funny, but um, actually it's important when you're in college, of course, you'll find out what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And so this was a great experience for me. Um, I, was a, I was a journalism major and I had a graphic arts minor. And I wanted to place more of the emphasis on marrying the two, journalism and art, because I was an illustrator. So I took um, graphics, uh, graphic art classes at San Diego State. And that included illustration. So it was a really amazingly uh, important set of classes that I took at San Diego State. Um, when I took an illustration class, I learned how to paint in acrylics. And I created these two paintings from um, a course in illustration. So um, you can see there that I wanted to, you know, basically marry my uh, knowledge of journalism and my ability to draw in infographics. To me, it was just logical. It was purely logical. And also it was a great time to do it because, you know, as you can see here, the total circulation of US daily newspapers was on the rise. A few years earlier, MTV and USA Today had come out. And those were both really graphically oriented, you know, um, media. And uh, it was a time when newspapers wanted to get more readership among young people. And they thought they could do that by um, having more colorful and larger infographics in the paper and images. Uh, what a lot of people don't forget is back in this, at this time, a lot of newspapers were in grayscale. And in fact, the New York Times was one of the last to use color in newspapers. So they wanted, um, people like me with my skills coming out of college to you know start doing infographics but at the time at least in California most of the artists in um, California were working for the advertising department I wanted to work in news and to to that extent I when I was at San Diego State I went over to the Union Tribune in San Diego the San Diego Union Tribune and I got to know the artists I was introduced um, to them and I used to sit and watch them work. And they did some extraordinary graphics, sometimes two page, huge graphics for uh, the San Diego Union Tribune, uh, including Ken Marshall. He was just a great artist uh, and in San Diego. So it was, a, it was a good time. What could go wrong, right? Well, this is kind of what went wrong. The um, uh, newspaper circulation went down and uh, uh, while I was at the Ithaca Journal, Santa Barbara News Press, the Examiner, and then the Chronicle. So around that time in 2007, I um, realized that, well, there was a lot of buyouts at the Chronicle um, and uh, layoffs and uh, maybe not layoffs, but at least buyouts. And because of the circulation going down, I, I realized maybe this is a good opportunity for me to leave and uh, leave journalism. And so I joined a, uh, like I said, Explain, which is a, uh, um, you know, a design firm in Portland. But the, uh, it's not as if, let me just say this, after I graduated from San Diego State through 2007, it's not as if we didn't 
put forth a great effort. Um, my colleagues, John Blanchard and Ty Humble and I in the graphics department, among others, um, I thought put together some great infographics over time. Uh, I remember the morning on, uh, it was a Saturday when uh, communications were lost with Columbia. And, by, uh, and I knew that I was gonna have to go into work on that Saturday. By the very next day, we had that graphic on the left-hand side that explained much of what happened that was available to us at the time. On the right-hand side, you'll see there, we had a daily full-page graphic on the movements of the troops and, uh, in, the, in the war in Iraq um, in, the, in the 90s. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry, in, in the 2000s. That was 2005, I believe. Uh, so we put forth a great effort. Nonetheless, um, circulation continued to decline. And uh, so I moved to Portland, Oregon. So, you know, basically what could go wrong? Well, I had a great experience. Like I said, I learned a lot, but there was the great recession of 2008. Uh, for those of you who remember it, it was almost like a depression. Uh, uh, employment went, you know, down like a slide. And right around that time, I was laid off. I was laid off from my job in Portland, Oregon. And I remember taking my portfolio to a design agency and, and uh, the Oregonian was not hiring, definitely not. And uh, at the design agency, they said, I don't know if there's any jobs for you in anywhere in Portland or maybe not even Oregon. And so, uh, you know what? I was hesitant to go back to journalism and I didn't wanna leave the West Coast. But as a friend of mine said, when you're on stormy seas, aim for the safest port. And uh, so, as I said, I didn't wanna leave the West Coast, but a great opportunity opened up for me in New York City at the, the Wall Street Journal. And so I uh, moved to New York City. I'm currently, uh, as Temple said, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and I thought, well, what could go wrong? Uh, actually, this is what happened. I was standing in the newsroom, there's a lot of, TV camera, TV um, screens in the uh, newsroom of the Wall Street Journal. And I was standing in front looking at this in April of 2010 when I first started uh, at the Wall Street Journal. And my boss came over to me. He said, this is the deep water horizon. It just exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is your story. You're going to tell in graphics how it happened. You're going to explain all of the different ways that they're going to try to stop the leak. Uh, the oil spill, and they're and you're going to talk tell about how they're going to try to clean it up. Well, little little did I know that that this was going to be my story <laughs> for the next four months. Uh, I think it was four months. It was April, May, June, July, August, September. All right, six months. It's all kind of a blur. But I spent the next um, all those months doing infographics, talking, learning the latest technology, learning what a blowout preventer was, and you can see it in the lower right here and how big it is compared to um, you know, how tall a human is. And so I, uh, being at the Wall Street Journal, which is great because people would answer my calls. I was able to talk to British Petroleum. I was able to talk to the Interior Department, Coast Guard, you name it. I, I, I basically followed their almost, day, well, their daily press conferences, but their daily efforts to try to stop the leak. At one point, they were even talking about plugging it using tennis balls. And I'm absolutely serious, you could look that up. Um, but uh, so I talked about the sequence of failures in one graphic, I talked about all the different endeavors underwater to try to stop the leak and then ultimately um, how they tried to clean it up after the oil went to the surface. And then finally, when Congress had hearings about the spill, I did infographics um, based on that congressional testimony from British Petroleum and others. So Temple asked me to talk about the types of infographics that I have done in my career. And uh, so this was just one set of breaking news infographics. While I was doing these, I was doing many others. Uh, we did breaking news. Uh, I created infographics on breaking news um, about how MERS spread in South Korea, uh, how the Fukushima, um, you know, nuclear plants um, exploded after the uh, tsunami and nearby earthquake. 
um, and also how facial recognition devices work. A uh, few years ago, New York City was thinking about adopting this, and there, and but it was abandoned because of the controversy. But now, Eric uh, Adams, the mayor of uh, New York, is actually thinking about bringing these back. I heard it mentioned on MSNBC the other day. Um, so uh, also, I worked on science infographics. You can see here on the upper left um, these viruses called bacteriophages attacking. Uh, also lobotomy. I did this graphic. My boss at the time, Seth, uh, asked me to use his head as the as the uh, basis of this drawing. It was for a set of stories by a reporter of ours at the Wall Street Journal who um, found some files about how veterans of World War II um, were undergoing lobotomies because of their post-traumatic stress disorders. And, um, and in the 1950s, I believe, and I think this was even in Berkeley, California. Uh, and it won a national press award for the graphics and the stories on, on related to that. Um, also, I did a graphic about growing a human heart with human stem cells. This is all theoretical. I don't think it's been done yet. And then also um, a near mess, miss where um, an asteroid about the size of uh, an aircraft carrier almost hit the earth. I also did graphics about technology and augmented reality, robotics, virtual reality on the left, and then drones on the right in the center and on the right, and how in theory in the future, um, we may have packages delivered to our front doorstep and also how drones are being used in war. And by the way, in the middle there, yes, you do see on the driveway a little guy dancing because he's just received a package. So just thought I'd point that out. Um, and then I also did finance, obviously it's the Wall Street Journal. So we did a ton of financial and economic graphics. Uh, the one on the left is the 50th anniversary of Warren Buffett joining uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Also uh, the finances of Los Angeles International Airport and then a, the complexity of a mogul's real estate and investing company's network. And then finally, uh, oops, sorry, I'll go back one. Down below, uh, supply chain shipping at US ports. So some of these are, are prescient because they're, uh, they were done, these graphics were done, you know, five, six, seven, no, I'm sorry, over six years ago. And uh, they're, they're coming back and are in the news again. So, um, Despite, like I said, our efforts doing graphics, um, newspaper employees continue to go down. But I'm optimistic. I have seen how unique uh, visitors at newspaper websites are, on, are increasing. And I also see a rise of data visualization. So there may be fewer illustrated infographics the way that I created them back in the day, but there's a rise of these kind of infographics. If you just Google data visualization, wsj.com or the New York Times, uh, among many newspapers are employing data visualization. That's where you take huge databases of, of, of numbers from the census department, for example, or, or other sources. And uh, they're doing great work, for example, with the um, COVID virus and, and infection rates and that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm optimistic. I think that people, as Temple pointed out, storytelling can take all different shapes and, uh, and methods. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, newspapers will continue to survive online at least. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how I arrived at my conclu the, the conclusion, how I did some initial sketches did some editing and then how my final infographic appeared in the newspaper. Um, but before I do that, I just thought I'd mention um, that my first job, uh, these were this was pivotal, was having learned the Macintosh computer. So I learned the Mac Plus at the Ithaca Journal. I don't have a lot um, to in my portfolio, at least in the examples you'll see here from the Ithaca Journal, but it was really pivotal. I worked with some great people and uh, learned the Mac Plus. And then um, 
I got a job at the Santa Barbara News Press. Now, let me just back up here a bit. When I, I mentioned earlier that I went to the San Diego Union Tribune and uh, hung out with the artists there to find out you know, what they were doing, the kind of infographics that they did. Well, when the uh, a top editor from the Union Tribune moved to Santa Barbara to become the executive editor, he asked those artists, um, you know, who you would recommend, who they'd recommend for a job to become graphics, uh, a graphics uh, um, per person at the Santa Barbara News Press, and he recommended me. So that's really important to keep your network um, open and to to remain in touch with your friends and professional colleagues. So that was a great opportunity for me to move back to California where I learned the Mac 2 and then also Adobe Illustrator, which I continue to use this day to this day. Adobe Illustrator is a great tool. So my first assignment uh, while working with uh, graphics editor, Arthur Griffiths, um, who I learned so much from uh, over the years, um, both about graphic design, uh, illustration, uh, you know, page design, and even photography. Uh, one of his famous quotes to me was crop until it hurts. And uh, so I even use that when I post photos on Instagram today. It, it was a great experience. I learned a lot from him. One of my first uh, assignments at the Santa Barbara News Press was to do a graphic about two ships that had collided a year before I even got there. One of them, I'm not sure about the second ship. I don't know if it sunk, but one of them sunk. It was called a Pack Baroness. And it was carrying iron ore, um, I'm sorry, copper ore and other environmentally hazardous debris. And when it went down, uh, that hazardous debris was distributed across the, the seabed. And so at one point, the story was that a year later, when I started, they had a press conference about how they were able to take remotely operated submersible cameras and go down and take a look at it. Now, I went there to this press conference and I watched the video and it was really amazing how they were able to take this camera, just like you saw years later with the Titanic, but at the time it was really new technology and look down at that ship. And my assignment was basically to do this diagram of how they went about and did, did that. Um, and uh, so uh, I got some source material. I did not have a digital camera at the time. In fact, there was not even any email. Don't get me started, but seriously, not even any email at that time. This was 1988. Um, and I didn't have a digital camera to take pictures of their video. So they faxed me this source material. This is the Pack Baroness wreck on the ground floor, reconstructed. Um, and then they wrote some notes for me and talked about you know, what it looked like. And this is basically what I had. And I was just getting to learn Adobe Illustrator. I zoomed in on one of the source uh, materials that they gave me and I could see a ship. I could see how it was broken into a couple different pieces and I did a sketch. And that's my sketch on the left. I refined it a little bit more in the middle. And then ultimately that was my drawing on the right. Uh, then I went to my sources, reporters, editors, other people involved with the, you know, the whole story. And um, you can see my notes there, there are holes and cracks there. There are um, some, there's a dent on the left. And I drew the, the ship as it all, was on the floor. I also wanted to include the submersible that would go went down and uh, took the video. And I also wanted to include the state fish. Do any of you know what the state fish is for California? It's the Garibaldi. Um, and so I included that there. And um, so this is the final graphic. Now, I think I was proud of that, that infographic. I think it told the story. Um, but what I did is I consciously, um, you know, condensed the distance. Um, but I think if I were to do it over again, I would talk about the depth at which they went from this boat and lowered this submersible in order to take these videos. Uh, this is how it appeared in the newspaper. And the headline told what I should have included in the story that it was a 1500 foot deep grave. Um, and so I 
you know, proved to myself that in Adobe Illustrator, I could draw a dolphin and a Garibaldi fish, but, you know, I should have been thinking more about um, showing one of the more important parts of the story, and that is the depth. So I kept that in mind on my next assignment. My next assignment was to do a graphic that, ex that explained how the 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara occurred. We were doing a 20th anniversary um, special section of the 1969 oil spill. So in that case, I wanted to uh, do a graphic that would explain exactly how deep they drilled in order to get this oil. But first I had to do some research. So um, my editors and I flew out in a helicopter to a platform, not the one that had the oil spill, but a different one. And there we are in the helicopter, outside the helicopter. And that's me on the far right. Um, in case you don't recognize me, that's uh, the platform Hidalgo in the middle. That's where we went. And it was amazing. It's like a little city. I, I was just so astounded by it. Uh, the living quarters, the shopping area uh, where you can, and the, the, the um, caf cafeteria, et cetera. It's a huge operation out there on the water. It's just amazing. Um, so after I gathered all my research, talked to reporters, I talked to Unical, uh, which was the owner of the platform at the time. Um, then I did my sketch and you can see in the middle here of my sketch is where I wanted to show the depth. I really wanted to show it in proportion, how deep they went. But I also wanted to show uh, number one, the platform. Number two, I wanted to detail the drill bit. Number three, I wanted to talk about the cement casing. And then number four, I wanted to talk about how the oil escaped and how everything went terribly wrong. So from that sketch, I took it into Adobe Illustrator and I drew this. And you can see not only those four or five different aspects uh, that I wanted to include in the infographic, but how much editing went into it. Again, your, your heart kind of drops, you know, when you <laughs> are told your graphic needs this, needs this, needs this, needs this. Um, but it was so great because we got the story right. There was no correction needed on it because we, you know, I took this graphic to numerous people and I asked them, is this correct? Can you read this over? And um, we, we made a number of fixes and revisions until we actually concluded with this infographic right here. So you can see that in the middle, um, I did show it proportionally correct. Every 200 feet is ticked off um, on the um, two scale area. And as I and you saw in the initial sketch, I included information about the platform, the rig itself, and all that was involved there, the drill a bit, and the drilling pipe, and then ultimately number four, the, the blowout and how that happened. And again, this is the scale on which it occurred and then uh, this is how it appeared in the paper. It was the largest spill, oil spill in the United States at the time. And Richard Nixon came out and visited the um, oil on the you know, beach. And it was shortly thereafter that the Environmental Protection Agency was created. So it was a really big deal at the time. Um, next, I did a, I was, I think I was working for the examiner at this time. And I did a freelance job for the New York Times, they asked me to do an infographic that would explain how TV stations were converting to high definition TV. And so they faxed me that page on the left there and they said, here's the hole you need to fill. <laughs> it was a blank space, you know, and in a couple of days, my infographic was gonna go there. So they wanted to show, uh, it, we talked about it and we concluded that we wanted to show a cutaway of a generic uh, high definition TV station. And, and you can see in the lower left, I'm sorry, lower right, um, in the blue writing that I have there, I'll blow it up for you here, what I wanted to include on platform. So first of all, I wanted to show a reporter and a camera person. Um, and then number two, I wanted to show the, the mobile unit, the truck, uh, control room, 
the anchors at a studio, the editing room, the transmission tower. And then ultimately at the very end, I wanted to show a couple watching TV. So it shows all phases of the uh, conversion to high definition, high definition TV. Now the New York Times actually um, paid a photographer. Well, I took my own photos, but I also was accompanied with a photographer as I went to the different locations within San Francisco at a couple of different TV stations. And I also did um, my research by learning more about what was in a TV station um, by looking at different like visual dictionaries. And this is an excerpt from one of them. But the photographs, uh, including those on the left are from actual TV stations. You can see me in the middle there. Uh, I was gonna use that as my source material. My friend Lance uh, and, and then over there on the right are the, is the um, couple watching TV and below that is the mobile unit. And here's my sketch coupled with those photographs. So you can see the reporter and anchor the, uh, on the scene and then the reporter and anchor um, uh, you know, on the set and then the actual studio itself. And then at the very bottom, the couple watching TV. And you can see I sketched that all out and used my photos for reference. Um, and again, I'm going back to the editing phase. And this is so very vital, you know, that you get it right. And so you can see how marked up my drawing was uh, by the various sources and editors and, you know, people from the New York Times. And that resulted in this. This is the final infographic as it appeared in the New York Times and my drawings that I created in Adobe Illustrator. You can see number one, the reporters, sound technicians, the studio set camera operators, and how each of them were involved in converting stations to HDTV. So here is a, a bit of a close up. You can see, uh, <laughs> I even put, the people's faces on the monitors down below. And then this is ultimately how it appeared in the paper. And I was told at the time that it was the first color infographic to appear in the New York Times. Uh, next, for the San Francisco Chronicle, I um, did a graphic about invasive species in the San Francisco Bay. And um, so what you see here is a sketch by my colleague, the reporter, Glenn Martin. Glenn used to do these really great drawings for me uh, and they were pretty hilarious. Um, and they were just kind of cute. They were, they were so important to me in putting together my infographics. Uh, he was a science reporter and just did a, an amazing job uh, writing very clear stories. Uh, but so his drawing represents how refineries in the Bay um, and also agricultural runoff resulted in selenium build it, building up in the Bay. Now, while that was happening, ships were coming in from Asia and they were carrying these invasive species, these Asian clams that went onto the, 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 the floor of the, of the Bay. And then these native species would eat the clams uh, that had, siphoned in the um, selenium and other uh, agricultural runoff. So what I wanted to do is take Glenn's drawing here and organize it into kind of like a, a clockwise organization. So you can see my sketch here. Uh, you can see the factories, uh, the refinery on the top, the ship coming in on the right with the clams and then the native species uh, chomping on those clams as Glenn had portrayed them. So here more clearly, um, I wanted to show in a very compressed area. And the reason that is, is because real estate in any newspaper, print newspaper is very important. And I wanted to show the story, you know, pretty quickly and economically. And I found when I do infographics like this clockwise, um, they are best read when you start off at around 11 o'clock. So that's where I put number one, which is the factory. Number two is the ship. Number three are the clams and number four are the uh, ducks and sturgeon. And then this ultimately the graphic that I created. Number one, the selenium from the refineries and agricultural runoff is poured into the bay. The freighters bring in the Asian clams, which is number three. 
uh, the Asian clams si siphon and feed on the, um, the contaminated selenium and then the sturgeon and diving ducks eat the clams and then they get um, dangerous levels of selenium in their tissues. And that was the story. And then this is how it appeared in the newspaper. Later, I was asked at the uh, San Francisco Chronicle to create an infographic explaining how the new East Bay, East span of the new Bay Bridge was being built in 2004. So again, I had to learn a lot about the technology behind this and uh, ultimately collaborated uh, with my colleagues, John Blanchard and Todd Trumbull. Uh, John did a great job of explaining the, how the piles were being driven down into uh, the bay to create the, um, you know, what would hold up the roadway throughout the whole thing. And then I also had to learn about hinge pipe beams, which were going to level the, the surface uh, of the bridge and you can see an engineer's drawing on a yellow sticky there on the left. And then I also wanted to include the span. So I was given a full page to do this infographic, but I really wanted to tell a story. Uh, you can see here was my initial sketch and it is really sketchy, but I wanted to focus primarily on the tower and, that, and also the roadway. So the roadway was gonna bend one way in case of an earthquake and then the tower would also accommodate uh, in case of an earthquake. So they were very conscious of that. And I wanted to make that kind of a focus of my infographic. So this was the initial sketch. This was the, um, the drawing in Adobe Illustrator. And you can see the editing process where I met with engineers, I met with Caltrans, uh, numerous sources along the way. And, you know, we just marked up my drawing, my initial drawing. And um, ultimately this was the infographic. Now, Initially, it's a lot to take in, but I really wanted to tell a story. So I organized it so that you could read it from top to bottom. So when you take a look at this and look at it from the very top, you'll see that I initially showed the east span and how it starts at Yerba Buena Island, the, then the suspension bridge, the skyway, and then the Oakland approach and how it spans a total of about 2.2 miles. And then I started a narrative. I said, topped by a flexible roadway, and there you can see the hinge pipe beams, and anchored by a strong, by strong piles and piers, um, and supported by a tower that will bend and not break. And then I show the depth. The structure will be the largest self-anchored single tower suspension bridge in the world. So that was the narrative, and then I filled it in with details. So if you read it from top to bottom, that's basically what you would capture from that infographic. And that infographic um, ultimately uh, won the Northern California uh, Professional Journalism Award for the best infographic of, of the year. Um, next, I did another invasive species graphic. This was for the Wall Street Journal. And um, my boss at the time, Seth, was you know, saying, hey, you know what, you can draw. Why not? I'd love to see more of your hand drawings rather than, you know, this hard edged um, Adobe Illustrator type of drawing. And so I did a sketch of these invasive spe species in Lake Michigan and um, decided to just marry it with a stock image of underwater. And I manipulated that in Photoshop and I combined the two of them and I created this infographic and you can see the drawing that I did of a sea lamprey, a couple of different invasive species, mussels, the round goby, and then the bloody shrimp. And that's how it appeared in the Wall Street Journal. Um, it, and then going back to what I was talking about earlier as far as deadline news, um, I arrived at work one day to hear about the attack on the US Embassy in Benghazi, Libya. Now, being the Wall Street Journal, we had reporters all around the world. We had a reporter in Libya who went to the scene afterwards and took a couple of photos and then also just walked off the whole area and took um, measurements, like in the number of steps, for example. And they did this great drawing on the right. And then I got it. They sent it to me. And then I got them on the phone. And we were able to talk about where the compound was and uh, where the ambassador who was killed 
uh, where the, his body was located, where the where the mob broke in and attacked the consulate, et cetera. So this was so important to me. But I realized after I had seen this that there's got to be a satellite image. So I went online to Google Earth and I found it. I found basically her drawing from the sky, which was just so helpful to me. And then I married the uh, drawing of the reporter. I, I, I coupled that with the uh, uh, satellite image and then her narrative about what happened. And I compiled that all into this drawing in Adobe Illustrator and uh, drew the detail about how the mob gathered out front, moved to the consulate, and then we included a timeline along with the reporter's photos. And we got a pretty comprehensive infographic about how that occurred. So in about 2012, the Olympics were gonna be held at Wimbledon. I'm sorry, in, in, in England, but tennis was gonna be played in Wimbledon. Now. My boss at the time, he came to the graphics department and he said, everybody pick a sport. We want you to concentrate on one sport. And I chose tennis, I love tennis. So these were my initial sketches. Um, and the, the Olympics tennis was gonna be played at Wimbledon. And so I wanted to show, you know, and here's my initial sketch, how the ball bounced differently on grass because Wimbledon is a grass court and how differently it, bounces on a hard cement court and how it bounces differently um, you know on on other on grass courts grass clay and hard court um, and then I also wanted to show how the top world players have performed um, on grass I also wanted to show a little bit more about what the court is made of what's underneath the grass and believe it or not, being with the Wall Street Journal, people answered my phone calls. So I called the, 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 um, the person who maintains the grass at Wimbledon and he took my call. And so with that, I was able to do a cutaway of the grass and what was underneath it, how tall the grass is. Um, and I was also uh, able to do, you know, much of the other things that I had sketched out. And then this is ultimately how the graphic appeared. Now I chose Djokovic at the time in this infographic, but um, you know, I would include Ash Barty right now. She just won the Australian Open, which is on, you know, and she's now won tournaments on all three courts, which is pretty incredible. Um, so here's Djokovic and you can see how the ball would bounce higher on a clay court versus a hard court versus grass. You can see below that uh, Wimbledon center court, the grass is less than the height of a dime. And of course it gets worn away throughout the tournament, but it starts uh, less than half the size of a dime. And then there's sand and clay, et cetera. But I was able to get this information from the groundskeeper, which was pretty cool. And then I changed the pie charts from their traditional look into tennis balls. And then the strategy of work, playing on a clay court versus a, a grass court. So as you can see, as my time went along doing infographics, they became a little bit more fun, more playful. Um, and so I had an opportunity to do a graphic on how to economically fill your, pack your groceries. Uh, this was a story in the Wall Street Journal and the reporter said, super value stores use more than 1.5 billion bags a year and the company believes it can save millions of dollars by boosting the average number of items packed in each bag. So they wanted me to show in an infographic how to properly pack your grocery bag <laughs> so that you could use fewer bags. Now, I, I don't know if they save, you know, millions of dollars on bags, but um, the reporter told me what they wanted to include. Uh, so I did my sketches. And I thought, well, how am I gonna draw these things? Am I gonna just draw and take photographs and put it together in Photoshop? Am I gonna draw them in Adobe Illustrator? Um, but I thought, wow, I'm gonna have some fun with this. Now, I always wanted, I, always, I kept a lot of different source material which would inspire me. And so I took a look at these things. I did not create these. These are like clip art from my things that I've saved. And I thought, 
Um, now, the one on the left is a very current. It's from a TV show I saw on Netflix. So I did not rely on this, but it reminded me of what I was trying to do here. And basically, that was to create the infographic out of clay. I wanted to use Sculpey and create each of those items that uh, are going to be included in a properly packed bag and also examples of how you should not pack a bag using clay. And so, so you can see here. Um, that I actually did that, uh, the milk carton, the orange juice, the cake mix, everything was built out of clay. And then I took photos of that and then ultimately put that together and then did call outs about how to properly pack that bag, putting heavier items on the bottom. And then over on the right, you can see the negative symbol, the red marking to indicate that this is not how to pack your bags. And this was really controversial. Even my mom weighed in on it. And she said, that's not how I want my bags packed. Uh, that's too many items per bag. And so um, I'm sure everybody had an opinion about that. But um, uh, so as you can see, I had some fun with that. We also had, by the way, speaking of uh, this kind of graphic, um, I also had the idea where I want we, we were showing the price of oil on a fever chart. You can see my hand going across the screen, the screen and how it was going down, right, in a fever chart. And I thought, wow, well, why don't we do a graphic with that fever chart going the full length of the page and behind it put oil drippings, right? Uh, well, initially we tried Hershey's syrup, but ultimately I think my colleague Eric Brindleson came up with his own a uh, combination of brake fluid and oil. And you wouldn't believe how many times in the photo department we spilled that oil until we perfectly lined it up with the fever chart of the price of oil over time. And uh, I guess I had enough credibility at the Wall Street Journal that they did not um, you know, veto this illustration of the price of oil. And uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, then towards the end of the time that I was at the Wall Street Journal, um, I asked, I raised my hand and I said, they're building the new Whitney Museum. I really want to do a cutaway. I want to do an infographic explaining how the, the Whitney is being built. And they said, well, you better hurry. We got a tour in a couple of days that includes the executive editor of the Wall Street Journal and others. And so um, sure enough, I went on that tour and you can see um, Jerry Baker on the upper right, along with um, Adam Weinberg, who's the director of the Whitney. He gave us a, a, a personal tour. You can see the status at the time of the tour. The lobby was still um, you know, under construction. And then in the left-hand side, Adam is showing us a diagram, which I used as reference. So my initial drawing was this sketch, you can see it's pretty rough, but I wanted to show on the left the different, the different uh, levels of what's gonna be on each floor. I wanted to do a cutaway of the theater, which you can see in the middle. And then I wanted to do the drawing itself with the river in the background. And then also the High Line. Those of you who have been to New York know that the High Line is a very famous tourist area. Actually, everybody loves it. It's an old rail line that goes on the um, on the west side of Manhattan, and it goes from the Whitney all the way up to the Hudson Yards project. So I wanted to include those features, and uh, this is my drawing, a little bit more refined. You can see the different elements labeled, and the high line on the bottom right. Uh, then I took this drawing and drew it in Adobe Illustrator. Now this was. The, the Whitney was designed by um, Renzo Piano, and I worked with an architect named Kevin Shorn, who was really extraordinary. He was meticulous, but he was really, really nice to work with, as well as, you know, obviously people from the Whitney uh, who were extremely helpful, as well as the reporter and editors. Um, and you can see how the my drawing was refined based on their input. So you can see here, there are red, there's red all over this drawing because we wanted to revise things and make sure we got it right. Uh, here, a lot of blue on, the, on my drawing um, because of different things that uh, Kevin and others marked up to get it right. You can see now I'm adding little people 
And then this is the one of the final stages of the revision. Um, on the bottom there in those white boxes, I wanted to show uh, examples of some of the artwork that was gonna be included in the Whitney. But here you can see the different levels on the left. You can see uh, Kevin or somebody even, look at on number three, the art classroom. He said, oh, there's a notch there that you forgot. <laughs> So that's how uh, detailed we wanted to get this meticulously right. So you can see uh, the levels on the left, you can see the Hudson River in the background, a cutaway of the theater um, and the High Line, and then ultimately the uh, paintings on the very bottom, some of the paintings that are gonna be, that would be included in the Whitney. Um, here's, if you zoom in, you can see the detail and how um, I drew uh, all the outdoor terraces, the stairways. Often I had to count, you know, the number of windows to make sure that it was right. The vertical railings along the, the you know, on the exterior, you can see a person, little person there in the middle walking their dog. <laughs> um, so it was a fun project. And uh, ultimately it was the last major infographic that I, that I created while working at a daily newspaper. And uh, there you can see my initial sketch, revisions, and then ultimately how it appeared in the paper. So it was a long journey starting at San Diego State where I started doing infographic, I'm sorry, started writing at the Daily Aztec and I coupled that with my minor of uh, graphic design and then um, had a really fruitful career at numerous locations around the country. And ultimately, I'm so appreciative to San Diego State, as well as all of my colleagues. These infographics represent a huge amount of collaboration uh, between uh, my sources, as well as graphics, as well as, um, you know, graphics editors, uh, colleagues, um, you name it. So I'm so appreciative of everybody's efforts that I've worked with and especially um, from where I started at San Diego State, which was a solid education. And uh, with that, I just want to thank you again for participating in this. And um, I'm available for questions. If we have time, I haven't looked at the clock. I may be way over Temple. I apologize. Uh, don't worry about it. You, um, we have a few minutes left and maybe we'll say a few minutes extra for those who want to uh, hear uh, some of these answers, because uh, we've got a lot of questions. So I'll just sort of start ram rattling them off and you can answer as, as quick as you can. Um, sure. First one was uh, working as a journalist is inherently uh, naturally satisfying and was curious if you're feeling that same professional fulfillment since you left journalism to move into more commercial work at uh, JP Morgan. Yeah, JP Morgan Chase, a lot of my stuff is being done, is internal. All, all of my stuff is internal. The public never sees it. I work with really, really brilliant. And oh, looks like I, I turned that me. off for you. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> so I'm people could see. You. Um, yeah. All right. Very good. Well, what I was saying is that I, I a lot of my stuff, all of my stuff is done internally for um, and I work with engineers and architects about the technology behind the bank. And so. It is very fulfilling uh, working for JP Morgan Chase because I'm building websites, for example. And so I've moved, in addition to Adobe Illustrator, I'm working in Figma, which allows me to create web pages and do and create apps that I've never been able to do before because I don't know how to code. I'm not a programmer. So this gives me an additional new uh, voice to create my um, graphics and that kind of thing. But yes, it is still fulfilling. Thank you for the question. Yeah, we've got a few questions about some of the process in terms of your drawings. Um, so are most uh, are most of the things that we saw in those um, illustrations original, like you drew them in Illustrator? Um, do you ever pull from like other sources, like you mentioned, like clip art, I mean, or type, yes. type of material? And then do you have any tips for, for people who aren't very good at like hand illustrating something? Right. For the most part, I did draw a lot of my material, but then uh, at the Wall Street Journal, um, we didn't necessarily hand draw. There was like stock images. You, you might remember the Los Angeles International Airport graphic. Um, some of those airplanes were I did not hand draw. And so I would recommend, yeah, do not 
take things without permission. I should, that kind of goes without saying, but don't use stock art unless you pay for it. Um, just don't grab stuff off the internet. Uh, subscribe, pay for it, and then publish it. Um, but in lieu of that, take your own photographs and trace them over in Illustrator if you can. Um, but yes, most of my, especially my earlier work was all hand-drawn. Great, and, and some questions about um, when you're working more on like a breaking deadline, what's the process uh, when you have a, a shorter time frame, uh, and then also just the process um, for ensuring that whatever you're, whatever you're creating is accurate? Wow, yeah, that's so important. Again, it's collaborative. Uh, there's, there are different phases. Initially, we'll be talking uh, told about a certain graphic assignment. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'll immediately go to talk to the reporter and very often than not, they're too busy writing the story to even turn their head to talk to you, to be honest with you. And it's the same for the editor. So a lot of times the stress is in not having that communication that is so essential. Um, one time I had a very important story about the price of um, coffee. And the editor walked me over to the reporter who, uh, and he said, that's her right there. And I stood over her as she was writing her story. And I said, um, I need some data for the price of coffee. And she wouldn't turn around. <laughs> and I said, by the way, what's that plant on your table? And she goes, oh, that's a coffee plant. And I said, really, where'd you get it? And she goes, Brazil. And we had a quick conversation. <laughs> and then immediately she goes, what do you need? And I said, the, the price of coffee beans in Brazil. And she said, okay, I'll email it to you right away. So I don't know if there's any magic necessarily in um, getting everybody to coordinate and work together, um, but you know, uh, in, in at the Wall Street Journal, it it was it was a great team that I worked with. Great team, a lot of uh, very cooperative and, and collegial people, and but you know what, a lot of stress too, to be honest with you, and some difficulties. But there was no magic behind it. It's. Um, you need you, you often need data, you need uh, information from sources. And uh, it, on daily deadline, it's, um, you know, we got it right far more often than we didn't. I'll put it that way. But that was what, what yeah. we always strived for was accuracy, absolutely. Another good question is, where do you see the most high quality infographics being published in news organizations today? I'm really not um, watching a lot outside of the San Francisco Chronicle, which continues to be a really high standard. Um, the, let me think, the, obviously the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post and the New York Times. I'm really not um, looking at a lot of other areas besides that, to be honest with you. That's my loss, because I know there's great stuff being produced outside of those those major areas. Um, it's my loss, but there's great stuff all over the country. But those are the ones that I most look at frequently, and they're they're just great, top top notch. I know you mentioned um, early on. I, we obviously saw the decline in newspaper uh, circulation, but then there's increase now on, on clicks, and that's giving you some optimism. So there's a question about sort of this the state of the journalism industry. And um, I'll phrase it as, you know, you're looking at it with some optimism. If you were going into the industry now, where do you think there the most potential is for um, journalism in the in in the coming years in terms of the jobs and the, or even the skills and anything like that? Well, like I mentioned, data visualization is just on fire right now. It's really really great. Um, these people who are programmers and developers are able to do you know, gymnastics with these visuals. And they're fantastic to watch and to see um, build out. Uh, I worked with the digital team at the Chronic or at the Wall Street Journal, and these people were just extraordinary. So I see great potential there. But I've been out of the field for six years, Temple, you would know far better than me. But uh, from a visual point of view, that's, that's where I see things going. All right, a couple more questions, and we'll then we'll let you go. Is there a recommended way to format the flow of text to not conflict with the way people read? 
how do you manage the design uh, you know, of different layouts so that the text isn't confusing? Um, and I learned that. I, was, I talked about the flow around in a clockwise way. I've started some infographics by mistake around one o'clock <laughs> and people are confused. They go, well, where, where do I start reading? But you know, I found out that really in a, in a circular way, people start tend to read on the upper left and then go around. Also a Z-like pattern. People, when they first look at a graphic real quickly, they read across the top, then they zip down to the lower left and then they read across like a Z. Um, but the, the, the most, you know, you know, common way people read or, is, or view things is left to right and top to bottom. And that's just, that's been the foundation for when I've created graphics and, and tried to do the flow of, of text. Great. Uh, one last question I'll ask you from MJ. This is a fun one to end on. Uh, it says, Joe, I know you have a great sense of humor. At the LA Times, the <laughs> photographers call the awful assignments gas bags. Do you have any memorable <laughs> gas bag assignments? Oh, Mary Jo, uh, you've stumped me. <laughs> uh, bad assignments, wow. Well, there were some really you know, challenging ones, but uh, none, none that I could you know, bring to mind other than that grocery bag graphic. Uh, that was, um, people made fun of me while I was making those different objects in claymation, to be honest with you. So maybe that's the gas bag. In this case, uh, my colleagues were like, what is he doing with this clay? This is crazy. And so I had to bring it home to work on it so that I would get less embarrassed by my colleagues. But um, so I think that's probably the best example I can give you. And thank you for the question, Mary Jo. <laughs> awesome. Well, I feel like that's a great place uh, to end and wrap up this uh, webinar. I want to thank you, Joe, so much for participating, for taking the time off. Um, from your job to, to speak with us. Um, hopefully the weather uh, is, is not too bad and you can join us in San Diego sometime uh, soon for a, for a little sun break. I uh, will. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for all the questions and for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye. -bye. Bye.